I will open it up. All right, everyone is coming in. We'll give folks a few minutes. All right, good evening, everyone. Hello, I am Jamai Wuyer, the founder of the National Black Cultural Information Trust, an initiative dedicated to sharing cultural information, stories, and resources that uplift the collective freedom of Black communities while also challenging cultural misinformation. This event is co-hosted co with the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America and COBRA, the premier mass-based coalition of organizations and individuals organized for the sole purpose of obtaining reparations for African descendants in the United States. This morning, the House Committee for the Judiciary Subcommittee and the Constitution, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties held a hearing on HR 40, exploring the past the path to reparative justice in America. Two of today's panelists gave testimony, Dreesen Heath of Human Rights Watch and Cam Howard, National Co-Chair of Encobra. The bill was originally introduced by the late Representative John Conyers Jr. in 1989 and is now sponsored by Representative Sheila Jackson Lee. This bill establishes the commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. The commission shall examine slavery and discrimination in the colonies and the United States from 1619 to the present and recommend appropriate remedies. This evening, two panels of reparationists, activists, and scholars will discuss the HR 40 bill and how to move the movement for reparations forward. As we follow today's discussion, please join us in using the hashtag HR40 Forum. Now I'd like to introduce my co-moderator, Reverend Mark Thompson, host of Make It Plain, member of ENCOBRA, the National African American Reparations Commission and the Black Church PAC. He will be joining us at 8 p.m. to co-host the 8 p.m. panel. So our first set of panelists are attorney Nikichi Taifa, the president of the Taifa Group and author of Black Power, Black Lawyer. Dr. Ron Daniels, convener of the National African American Reparations Commission and president of the Institute of Black World 21st Century. Then we have Jeffrey Robinson, Deputy Legal Director of ACLU, and Ms. Kenneth Henry, Chairperson of Encobra Legislative Committee. Welcome to all of our panelists tonight. Thank you so much for joining us for this important conversation. So the first question I wanted to start with is, what work is your organization currently doing to organize around reparations? Well, I'm not quite sure who wants to start, but since I kind of cross a lot of different organizations, I'm going to take the liberty. Is that okay, uh, Jessica? Sure, go ahead. All right. So I am a family member of INCOBA, National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. I'm an inaugural commissioner on NARC, the National African American Reparations uh, Commission. And I have my own firm, the Taifa Group um, LLC. And all, excuse me, and I am a past uh, lobbyist with the American Civil Liberties Union Washington office from way back in the day. Um, but all of these organizations have really been at the forefront with respect to the progression of reparations for um, Black people uh, in this country. And all of these groups are working collectively and uh, collaboratively. And I'm going to really just stop at this point because we have the movers and shakers of these groups right here on the line. We have the mover and shaker of the uh, Legislative uh, Commission co-chair of Incoba, Kenneth Henry, and we have the convener of the 
uh, 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 NARC, National African American Reparations Commission, Dr. Ron Daniels, and we have the mover and shaker, the person who really um, uh, served to really make sure that this issue was in the mainstream on the line, Jeffrey um, Robinson, currently with American Civil Liberties Union. So I'm going to just um, stop talking and turn it over to these mover and shakers in terms of what their organizations have been doing. Well, I'll do Okay. Go ahead. You Definitely go ahead, Ms. Oh, okay. Um, I am the um, national co-chair for the Legislative Commission for Encobra. I've been with Encobra about four years now. Um, prior to that, uh, I have a uh, interesting background of uh, working um, to uh, get legislation passed at the state level in Maryland and at the county level. Uh, I've done some other uh, interesting things at the federal level, but my most um, profound opportunity and, and, and what I bring to this group is I do a lot of the outreach, which means I have to get co-sponsors uh, and um, honestly, that, that is kind of like cold calling, if you will because you're selling someone who may or may not be willing to come on as a co-sponsor. And the thrill is when you see that you were able to actually sell them on the idea of coming on as a co-sponsor, especially for this piece of legislation, which um, it, there, there's no middle ground. You're either for it or you're against it. And last year, um, I, along with uh, an awesome group of collaborators, we were able to get 173 co-sponsors um, in the last session and this year in a, a very, very short period of time, we've actually been able to bring on 162 co-sponsors. And, and that is probably the, the, the thing that I am most proud of. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jeff Robinson, and I'm a deputy legal director at the American Civil Liberties Union. <clears throat> the American Civil Liberties Union has not historically been a significant supporter of H.R. 40, and that started to change several years ago. Our national board took a vote in 2019 that was anticipated to be a very uh, uh, it, it, it was definitely a spirited uh, vote with a spirited debate, but I think I had some concerns over whether uh, the ACLU would come out in support of HR 40, but our national board did. And not only did they come out in support of HR 40, but the ACLU has taken strides to work with the National African American Reparations Commission and in COBRA and the other black led groups that have been fighting for reparations for decades. So what's our role? We can promote the words and the work of the people who have been fighting for reparations with our platform. We can say that the largest civil rights organization in America has finally determined that HR 40 is a bill that has to pass. And working with Narcan and Cobra, we have put on forums around the country in Washington, DC, in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, to, uh, virtually from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we're planning another one at the beginning of March, following up on today's hearings, virtually from Seattle, Washington, with additional uh, collaboration with our Japanese American uh, co-activists and supporters. So the ACLU's role is to support the groups that are doing this work and to use our organization and our platform to get the word on HR 40 out as clearly as possible. Well, <clears throat> let me just say first and foremost, what a great day for reparations. Uh, my mentor, Queen Mother Moore, and the many of mentor of many of many of us is smiling today because this is an incredible moment in the history of reparations in this country. 
And I'm proud as uh, president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century, which specializes in cultivating a culture of collaboration to heal and empower Black families, communities, and nations uh, to be the convener of the National African American Reparations Commission, which is a collaborative of Black scholars and faith leaders and activists and organizers, uh, including foundationally in COBRA. And I must say, I'm honored to be a lifetime member. I was not privileged to be a founder, but I am a lifetime member of Encobra, and it is a great day for Encobra, the organization which for many, many years held us together, carried the struggle. And today to see Cam Howard testifying and, and to see Encobra on full, uh, fully there in the center of this and to see that Kenneth, that Kenneth Henry, that's this woman over here, this one, this is the baddest sister in the movement the hardest working, I mean, this is this phenomenal in terms of what she gets done. So it's a proud moment. And so what we do with the National African American Reparations Commission, it is one of, we have a 10 point program, which we, uh, we see as a potential framework, uh, frame of reference for the reparations debate. We support HR 40. We also are deeply involved in helping to deal and, and support local reparations initiatives. You'll hear later from Robin Ruth Simmons. We played an integral role in helping to certify that uh, Evanston, Illinois is a model. I think it's the model, but I'm supposed to be modest. It is a model for reparations initiatives all over the country. We also have the privilege of, of convening. One of the most exciting things that I've been able to do, I was a dear friend of Congressman John Connors. He can asked me many, many years to be the convener or facilitator of the HR 40 uh, Reparations Brain Trust or forums. Uh, and so I'm honored to have been, to be in a position to now facilitate. I think now we're going into maybe week 28. We have been busy, a broad coalition, putting their energy together, putting their efforts, putting our brain power together in order to push HR 40 to the point that it is now. So that's the role that we play. We have such great partners. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Robinson, you know, we came together and we've done these great forums all across the country. That was a major breakthrough. Human Rights Watch, Center for American Progress. I mean, there are just all of these and, and major faith organizations. Samuel D. Witt Proctor Conference, National Council of Churches. There is a huge group of people who are working on this. And that's why we're at this moment. And it is a significant moment in the history of reparations in this country. Akichi, did, did you get a chance to answer this question? Well, I don't know what to say other than I was there at that September 26, 1987 founding convention of uh, in Cobra, and I want to just give a little background, if I, you know, if I can, some little background that most folk don't really uh, know. But for year, for decades, this issue long before in Cobra had been kind of saddled within the nationalist, black nationalist, pan-Africanist uh, community uh, with organizations and individuals that I was with and connected with. A lot of people talk about Queen Mother Moore. Today, Queen Mother Moore was a pan-Africanist and she was a black nationalist. And the uh, founding actually came, at, 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 the, 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 the catalyst um, was a conference that the National Conference of Black Lawyers held at Harvard University in 1987, uh, wherein they invited three persons, myself, Chokwe Lumumba, and Mario Bedelli, to present papers on whether uh, in a, a constitutional amendment was needed to effectuate re re reparations. And all three of us concluded that no, a constitutional amendment was not needed because Everything that was already there was already there. We didn't need anything extra. The second clause of the 13th Amendment says that Congress should have the ability to enforce this amendment by appropriate measures. And we're saying reparations was one of those uh, measures. So when Imari Obadeli, again, from the Black nations community, saw the need to broaden this, connect, con con connected with <clears throat> National Conference of Black Lawyers and other groups, and called upon reparations loving people across the country to come to Washington to determine how we're gonna push this movement ahead. And the nationalists and pan-nationalists supplemented their politics to the back burner to allow for the greatest 
capacity of black folk to come together. Sororities and fraternities, church organizations, civil rights groups, the larger black community and the like. And this is the fruition today of that momentous time back in 1987. Thank you so much for that important background and history. Um, going that route, why HR 40? What about HR 40 moves the descendants of enslaved Africans towards full repair? Um, we can start with you, Dr. Daniels. Well, HR 40 is, um, first, of all, first of all, let me just say that uh, and we should also just remember John Conyers on this day too. I was glad his name was evoked today. Uh, reparations, Ray Jenkins. I mean, there's so many people out there whose names, Dr. Conrad World, and whose names should be mentioned at this moment because they play such integral role in the cross-generational struggle. Um, the, the reality is the bill, the first bill, uh, HR 40 introduced in 1989, was essentially a study bill, which was a good thing because it was an incredible organizing tool. But as things developed over the years, we all knew that enough studies had been done. And so it was in COBRA in, co in collaboration with the National African American Reparations Commission that actually rewrote the current bill to be a remedy bill, not just a study bill. And it's important for people to know that. It is a study bill, but it is a, a bill to study and develop reparations proposals for African-Americans. That is a qualitative difference. Now that doesn't mean that the struggle is over and so forth and so on, but we're no longer talking about whether reparations are warranted. We're talking about in what forms they shall take. The beauty of the way this was done is the bill was largely written on the basis of international principles that uh, Cam and others uh, uh, outlined today. The whole notion of full satisfaction uh, for, for and repair of our communities, all the things that are involved with that, non-repetition, uh, satisfaction, cost, uh, compensation, restitution, all of those things are built into uh, HR 40. And in an interesting kind of way, there's a lot of people talking these days about, you know, about uh, reconciliation and we're all for reconciliation, but reparations comes first. And the discussion and narrative about the story and history is built into the process. There will be conversations and narratives and discussions, but it is all to buttress the idea of full repair. Uh, and that's why HR 40 is so uh, significant. That's why it's so important. Uh, and that's why this is such a milestone moment in the history of people of Africa, of African people in this country. Is Henry, you have any thoughts on this? You're muted. Sorry, <clears throat> just a couple of basic thoughts. Um, in, in addition to those whose names we, we raise up, um, I also want to pay homage to Miss Callie House because she indeed was a pioneer in the reparations movement. And um, her story so moves me to want to stay in, in, in the forefront of this movement. Um, and as Dr. Daniels has said, it is about full repair. It, it's not about piecemealing. We have to have full repair. Uh, our communities are damaged and, 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 and to try and uh, do something other than resolve intergenerational poverty um, and, and uh, the disparate impact of healthcare, uh, the disparate impact of education, um, <clears throat> cannot be solved. It, 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 there's no way for it to be resolved unless we do have full repair and unless we do address those five areas of injury and make sure that reparations take the various forms that uh, have been already mentioned. And of course, you can always go to encobraonline.org to get more information, but uh, definitely, it cannot be uh, a hit and a miss. We have got to, to make sure that we bring it full circle and we do um, Miss Callie House um, a lot of, of, of honor for, for her taking up the battle so long ago. Thank you. Can I also just quickly make another point or two on this in this regard? Because this also came out in the hearing today. Uh, there's a lot of conversation, not only about reconciliation, but about equity. 
and it's all good. We, we want equity, but equity is about what happens from this point moving forward. It does not deal with the history of enslavement and all of the derivative racially exclusionary uh, policies that have damaged our communities uh, since that time, uh, since enslavement. So that's an important thing. We're not opposed to reconciliation. We're not opposed to equity. Equity is a good thing, but that's, that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about all of the accumulated damages that have occurred that can only be resolved uh, through, uh, through reparations. The other thing I thought was interesting to come out uh, and, uh, today is, you know, there are going to be a lot of not only equity, there are going to be a lot of things that are happening, good programs, Marshall Plan, whatever. There are a lot of good things that could happen. That's ordinary public policy. We're not talking about ordinary public policy. We're talking about policies that are, that are specifically related to uh, the issues of enslavement and all of the racially dis ex exclusionary policies that occurred after emancipation. So we, that's important because a lot of times in, as people are getting into the reparations movement, it's important that we have that kind of clarity. All good impulses, but reparations is distinctive in that it's, it's for full repair and it deals with the greatest Holocaust in human history and all of the derivative damages uh, flowing therefrom. Nikichi, thoughts? Uh, yes, I want to say, in addition to uh, those international uh, law standards, the criteria for reparations, which was brought out so eloquently um, in the hearing this morning on restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, uh, satisfaction, and uh, guarantees of non-repetition, uh, it's also important to um, submit that in the specific context of Black people in uh, this country, that the quest for reparations also encompass four elements. Number one, the formal acknowledgement that there was a historical wrong and an official unfettered um, uh, apology uh, for the dehumanization and atrocities of the um, enslavement era and beyond. And I say unfettered because both the House and the Senate passed um, uh, apologies um, you know, in the past. The Senate apology, however, came with a disclaimer that anyone who tried to use that apology as, um, um, you know, you, to, to, to seek reparations would not be able to do so. So we say official unfettered um, uh, apology. Number two, the recognition that the injury continued and still continues today throughout the years of of not only enslavement, but after enslavement and Jim Crow and Jim Crow apartheid and, um, um, you know, the, the, the policies and practices, whether it's in economics or health or um, uh, education, you know, the criminal punishment system, culture, the lack of the right to self-determination, all of those aspects. Number three, the commitment to redress by comparable parties, whether we're talking about the federal government, state and local governments, academic institutions, um, corporations, industries, uh, religious institutions and the like, all of whom enjoyed unjust enrichment. And then number four, the actual compensation in whatever form our forms are agreed upon. And I just wanna stress whatever form or forms are agreed upon because reparation must come from the injured parties uh, themselves. It's not something to be a judge from a high. The Robinson. <clears throat> I think the only thing that I would add uh, is the sense that I got from the hearing today that those speaking against HR 40 are desperate and just falling back on tired narratives that are neither factual nor accurate. And you heard this major discussion. I'll just give you one example. You heard this major discussion about the three fifths rule in the constitution. And there were people who were trying to say that, no, no, this was an example of how freedom-based America was. It was a compromise because the Northern people thought that the enslaved people shouldn't be counted at all. They weren't given human rights, so they shouldn't be counted. They tried to turn this into some kind of a morality debate. This was about money and about votes. 
And what it was about was not only Congress, but it was about the Electoral College, which was also created in the Constitution. And just in case anybody is wondering, did the Electoral College and the Three-Fifths Rule, were those things really created to protect the Southern ability to maintain the institution of slavery? Well, seven of the first 12 presidents of the United States came from Virginia and two others came from North Carolina and South Carolina. So nine of the first 12 presidents of the United States came from the South. The Electoral College and the Three-Fifths Rule did exactly what they were designed to do, to support and defend the institution of slavery. And so I was just taken, I, I was uh, amused, quite frankly, at what I considered to be the inaccurate and desperate attempts to fall back on narratives that have no credibility. And I think that's what the opposition is reduced to. Thank you for answering that. And going along that vein, one of the biggest issues that we have when we speak to people about reparations is some folks really believe we have no legal claim or try to complicate the claim. So Mr. Robinson, what is our legal claim concerning reparation? And you know, that's the interesting thing. HR 40 is not a lawsuit. HR 40 is a piece of legislation where Congress is saying, if we look at the history and determine that the history demonstrates that black people in America have been discriminated against for long after the institution of slavery. As Dr. Daniels said, you can't fix what brought us to 2021 with new policy going forward. The new policy going forward is critically important, but you can't fix what brought us here with new policy. And so I think that's what people need to understand. And, and just one last thing I would connect to that because these are some of the uh, objections that we heard today. Well, how far back do you go? You can't go back 400 years because America only started in, and now the dates get switched. It's either 1776 or 1787 or 1789 when the constitution was actually ratified. And, and the fact is this, I hope that many of the folks viewing have had a chance to look at the HBO series, The Wire. There was an actor who played a role, uh, the, the, the role was D'Angelo Barksdale, and he had this to say, you can make up a new story, you can say you're somebody new, but what happened before is what really happened. And what you did before is who you really are. And so the quote unquote British colonists that on July 3rd, 1776 were British colonists and on July 4th, 1776 were all of a sudden Americans, they brought with them their sins, their behaviors and their commitment to white supremacy when they became America. That's why we say going back to 1619. And so all of these things are tied into what Dr. Daniels and Nikichi and Kenneth and others have talked about in terms of the basic reason why reparations is repair for the past, not good policy for the future. Thank you so much for that response. Anyone else have anything to add? Uh, yes, I will also just add Attorney Jeffrey Robinson is absolutely correct. HR 40 is legislation, it's not litigation. There is litigation going on though right now. There has been litigation that's gone on in the past. Thus far, just about all the, the litigation has been um, struck down, whether it was on um, um, a specious state statute of limitations grounds, you know, or the like. And I say specious because, you know, it's like in Tulsa, really, um, there were this lit litigation going on now, but the past lawsuit that was squashed had also had living descendants. I mean, people in the 90s, in their hundreds, okay, centurions, okay, who were part of that um, uh, claim. And what, 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 what was said, what the state was saying was that, well, you didn't speak up before. Well, one of the reasons why they didn't speak up was because the information had been withheld or people were terrified, traumatized. That's part of the reparations thing. The, trauma and the intergenerational 
uh, trauma as a result of these atrocities. The casket is just now being opened up across the country on these atrocities, whether they're Tulsa, Oklahoma, or Elaine, Arkansas, or um, Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, or um, uh, um, Colfax, Louisiana, or, uh, you know, the list goes on and on ad infinitum, you know, almost. And the more and more you hear, you say, like Gil Scott here and say, who's going to pay reparations on my soul? It's not just the economics. It's not just economic. There's so many of the injury areas that we have been inflicted upon, meaning that the remedy must be so many as well. So it must be multifaceted um, as well. Another um, area I just might want to um, 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 raise uh, is that sometimes the argument is made, well, this isn't a legal issue. Okay, this is an issue for policy. Well, we got votes in both camps, in the legislative camp, the policy camp, in the litigation uh, camp as well. And then a, a, one final argument that's raised is uh, sometimes the, the issue of latches. Latches is a legal document that basically says if you sleep on your claim, if you don't bring it up, then you're foreclosed uh, from ever bringing it up. Well, as we have always brought up, from Encoba to NARC to all of the organizations, there has never been a period of time when Black people have not talked about and, and, and sought for the issue of reparations as, as, as uh, Kenneth talked about uh, Callie House and before that there was Belinda Boyo and there was Henrietta uh, Woods and then there was uh, uh, um, uh, the Marcus Garvey and the UNIA and, you know, Queen Mother Moore, even Martin Luther King, yes, all the way down to uh, the Black Panther Party and the Nation of Islam and the Republic of New Africa and the list goes on and on, the Black United Front, all the way, the, the National African uh, Na A A A African National Reparations Organization, all the way down to NCOBRA, which I credit being the uh, the dawning of the modern era of the reparations movement, and we're going to be bringing it to fruition now. Thank you so much. Um, so the big question, and this is a question we get all the time, our chat is filling up with the, this question, the Q&A, what is reparations? What does it look like for us? Is it a cash payment? Is it policies? Is it structural adjustments? What is reparations? What does it look like for descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States? Um, Miss Kenneth Henry, would you like to go first? Um, sure. Um, reparations has, it can take on the appearance of so many different forms. And let's start with the cash payment, uh, because that seems to be the, the number one issue. Where's my check? Cut my check. Give me my check. Um, when we speak about intergenerational poverty, um, checks do not solve the problem of intergenerational pro uh, poverty. It is money, you cash your check, you spend it, and that's the end of it. Reparations must take on a variety of different formats because there are so many ills in our communities and they have to be resolved. And you cannot resolve every issue with a check. Uh, I'm not saying that that uh, financial remuneration cannot be a part of it, but there are so many other things that have to be dealt with. We have to deal with the uh, fact that in our community, and, and, and it has become very apparent with COVID-19, that we have health issues that go um, much deeper than other ethnic groups. Um, we have educational issues um, that have to be dealt with. We have housing issues that must be dealt with. Um, there's just so much that has to be corrected and repaired, full repair. And just to give somebody a check is not going to, 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 to solve those issues. So for me, I'm, I'm not saying don't give folk a check. What I'm saying is reparations must be full repair. It must be full reparations. It must be full repair. And we must be able to declare that there has been a healing process that has taken place. Dr. Daniels, you're muted. And I think that's incredibly important. And this is a highly debated question. 
and and I think the, the, the I don't think anyone is discounting the possibility of people getting checks. It's just that it has been reduced to a check. But really, it's much bigger than that. And I was so delighted that uh, Dreesen Heath, for example, you know, talked about Tulsa. And so even if all of the descendants, and first of all, there's a tragedy, there's a resistance to doing anything, but even if all of them had received compensation or a check, it really does not replace community. The Greenwood District, which is Black Wall Street, and I learned that through, you know, I, I always thought it was just Black Wall Street, but there's a green, Greenwood, that community was destroyed. In order to replace that, that takes more than a check. That takes looking at how do you restore community. And so much of what we talk about in terms of the National African American Reparations Commission is yes, individual benefits are, are, are you know, they're, they're, if where they're warranted, that, that's fine. But in some ways, the, the, the question of the collective becomes important. Ujima, I mean, Ujima, the collective, the, the community. So for example, how do we talk about, and Kenneth referenced it, you know, how do we talk about land and economic development for the totality of our community? How do we talk about repairing the healthcare infrastructure within our community, communications infrastructure? I mean, these are community-based concepts that we need to also focus in because we have seen community after community after community destroyed. So Elaine, Arkansas, they're not necessarily looking for a check. They're talking about how do, how do you restore the community, but also restoring memory, identity. So it's deeper than just, again, the question of a check. And you massacre after massacre after massacre, not just massacres, it was mentioned today. You know, the whole question of, of urban renewal, gentrification, displacing black people and black culture. How do we retain community? And so I'd like people to really think about that so that it's not one against the other. It is really a bigger, broader concept of how do we again achieve full repair, full uh, uh, restitution of our people. And that requires us to also focus on the, the collective uh, in its entirety, I might say. So shall I jump in? Yes, yeah, sure. OK. Uh, so the harms from the enslavement era and thereafter, they were multifaceted, as I always say. Thus, the remedy must be multifaceted as well. I will be the first to say, OK, at, you know, because I always bring this up that cash payments, direct benefits are an important and necessary component of any claim for damages. I'm a lawyer, you get hit by a car, you know, then you get damages, that's what, what it is. I know my mentor, Brother Mari said, I wanna get my teeth fixed, but that's just one teeny weeny small part of it, okay? The crux is that a reparation settlement can be fashioned in any way as necessary in any form it's necessary to equitably address the countless manifestations of genocidal treatment that uh, accrue from chattel slavery and uh, its continuing vestiges. Some forms of um, collective benefit could be land. Can we talk about land? Can be housing, can be community and economic development, can be cessation of taxation, can be the right to self-determination, can be repatriation resources, can be the erection of, of monuments and, uh, and museums, it can be scholarship, it can be truthful textbooks, it can be correcting the, um, uh, the excesses of the war on drugs, which has been targeted to Black people, it can be pardons, okay? commutation of sentence clemency for those who uh, were victims of the COINTELPRO counterintelligence um, um, uh, uh, era. Uh, the bottom line, though, is that the commission, HR 40, is the province of the commission to bring the minds together to come up with these recommendations, not for me to just spout it out or someone else and say, I have the end all or whatever. It's from the body of experts to come to hear from the community, okay? And put forth some proposals um, for um, consideration. Could I follow up on that briefly? Because what Nikichi said was so important. 
And I hope folks uh, saw today at the hearing, Kathy Masoyoka from the Japanese American community who did a fantastic job of testifying. And as she said herself, when this issue first came up in the Japanese American community, she was against reparations. And there were many Japanese Americans who were against reparations or who thought it should go this way and not that way. And part of her testimony that I think was so important and part of what we can learn from their experience is that, as she said, the commission is a beautiful vehicle to bring people together to have these discussions. There are so many people saying, I know what the solution is. It has to be my way or it's not real reparations. And what I want to say to them is, who died and appointed you God? Who said that you're the most brilliant person on the face of the earth? Maybe I have an idea that's different from yours. And I think my idea should get the same respect as yours. That's why you have a commission of experts who can bring this information together. And in the conversation and the hashing out of what it should look like, there is not only a healing process that goes on, but the result will be better than any one person or any one group could ever come up with. So our Japanese American uh, collaborators and, and supporters, you know, have shown us how this process can work and the beauty of this process. It's not perfect, but there is nothing that is perfect in human existence. This is a way for America to have what I refer to as a naked lunch moment with our history, meaning that moment when everyone has to look at what's really on the end of their fork. And when people see that reality, the discussion about reparations becomes even more real. All right, any more thoughts on this? Okay, so we have about 17 minutes left with this panel and I'm going to go into uh, um, a question uh, of contention. <laughs> so right now, as HR 40 is becoming more popular, more people are talking about it. Another hot topic concerning HR 40 is the idea that it needs to be edited or scrapped and we start over again. And there's been circulating these, um, these list of proposed edits from various sources and people. One, uh, so there's two, and uh, Mr. Robinson, you addressed one part of the edits earlier, but part of the proposed edits pushed forward are that um, our justice claim should be limited to 1776 instead of 1619, um, and that uh, there, there needs to be uh, the creation of an eligibility identity standard to prove um, African ancestry in America to be an eligible recipient of uh, reparations. What are your, your thoughts on these? Do, does HR 40 need edits or does HR 40 need to be passed? Anyone well, I would, can well, I would say, uh, again, these ideas can certainly be presented to the commission for consideration. Um, but I think that there's, there's a reason why we have had organizations uh, over the, 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 the decades and the generations working on this issue. Uh, what we've had recently are well-meaning folks and maybe some who may not be so well-meaning who are dropping in ideas that have largely been rejected in the past. For example, you know, many of us, and, and Sister Nkichi referenced it, referenced it the reparations movement largely came out of the nationalist pan-Africanist community. That does not mean we didn't have debates, we don't have differences, but there is a notion about pan-Africanism. There's a notion about the holistic um, uh, um, no, na nature of what, the, what enslavement meant. So some people are, you know, trying to go to particular eras and particular periods. You know, a lot of people got dropped off in this country uh, during the course of the slave trade. I don't know how we sort of trace that back. What we do know is that if you are an African person in the Caribbean, for example, or in Central and South America, you suffered some form of enslavement. Malcolm's folks, uh, Shirley Chisholm's folks, yes, Kamala Harris folks, suffered some form 
uh, of, of enslavement. Uh, the other issue becomes uh, when you come to this country even now, what we do know is that our communities are underdeveloped and that our communities are still being victimized by racially exclusionary policies now, like the war on drugs. Nobody asked Am Amadou Diallo whether or not he was Haitian or, or I'm sorry, from, from Guinea or, or Abner Lumima, whether he was from Haiti. You know, it's like Malcolm said, we all catch hell for the same reason. We all catch hell because we are black people. The other thing becomes, even if we could come up with some eligibility qualifications, are you telling me that we're going to actually try to get some tests out and test people's blood to try to find out which one of us is and which one of us ain't? I mean, to me, I'm sorry. I mean, we, we don't need to go down that path. Uh, we are all still in underdeveloped communities. There are ways in which as we break this out, you know, uh, Professor Ogletree was quoted today of saying, well, there are the least among us and, and people who may need more than others and so forth and so on. But we're certainly gonna, uh, I don't think should do that on the basis of blood quantum, trying to figure out who is and who ain't uh, in relationship a person who actually was a, uh, a descendant of, uh, of, 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 of American slavery. Uh, I have a fundamental uh, uh, objection to that. I think it's black nativists in some respects. And I also think it is obviously anti-pan-Africanism and, and therefore cannot stand with that position. Dr. Robinson, you have thoughts on this too? Well, I just, you know, Cam Howard wrote a response to uh, the other issue about, you know, we can't start before 1776. And if you, just for as an analogy, if you have three corporations that have been violating people's rights and making millions and millions of dollars on those violations, and a bigger corporation comes and buys all of them up, the bigger corporation can't say, oh, well, that wasn't me. I wasn't doing that. That was those other people that were doing it. The argument makes no sense because when the colonies that became America were existing from 1619 to 1776, they were building huge amounts of wealth on the institution of slavery. And when they came together in the Constitutional Convention, they said to each other, the issue of slavery was right on the middle of the table. And James Madison, the father of the Constitution, the, the, the ones that people say, oh, he was so against slavery, one of the things he said to people is, don't worry about these enslaved people being freed because there is nothing in the constitution that says that they will ever be freed. So America came together, looked at exactly what the white supremacy and racism that was going on in the colonies was. They looked exactly at it and they said, not only do we like it, we're doubling down on it. And so that's why America can't escape responsibility for what happened before 1776, because America took the benefits of chattel slavery from 1619 to 1776. If you take the benefits, then you've got to take the responsibility. And I would say that um, I am a descendant of Africans enslaved in the United States. I want to repeat that. A descendant of Africans enslaved in the American in, in, in the United States. I'm not an American descendant of slaves or an American descendant of, of slavery. HR 40 has already been fixed. It's been fixed to go from a study bill to a remedy bill. We need to not fix it any further. It needs to be passed. Pass HR 40 and then we can come up with all of these other issues that are coming up in terms of um, identity and operationalizing and et cetera, et cetera. But let's pass the bill so that we can get around the necessary task of, um, of, of putting it in, into reality. Sounds like a good hashtag, pass the bill. <laughs> um, I'd like to jump in just for a minute, please. <clears throat> Um, just want to echo everything that everyone has said about this topic, but we do live in a uh, land uh, of democratic ideals <clears throat> and opportunities. And the one thing that 
can always happen is if you go to congress.gov and type in anything, you'll see that there are numerous bills on the same title, on the same uh, topic, about the same thing. So anytime there is legislation that does not meet with the criteria or the expectations of anyone, then there is that freedom to write your own legislation, find a bill sponsor, introduce it, and, and, and go through the process of lobbying to get it passed. But to just um, pick something that's, that, that's asinine and, and to try and make a, a, a big issue out of it, um, we don't have the time for that. We don't have the luxury, we don't have the time and as we say in one of our campaigns, we can no longer wait. We have to pass HR 40. There will be opportunities for anyone who has input into the process to, to present themselves and, and, and to say whatever they need to say, uh, either in favor of the bill or against the bill. But um, again, we live in a we live in a we live in a land of dem democratic ideals, and that dictates that you can find someone to sponsor your your legislation, and 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 move forward. Uh, we don't have to waste our time just belaboring uh, insignificant issues. Thank you. And, and could I just correct something that I said very quickly because I think it's really important. When Kathy Masayoka testified today, she said that she, or what I said about her testimony was that she was against reparations. She was not against reparations. She was always for reparations. She was against the commission because she felt that they didn't need a commission to tell the truth about what everybody knew was the truth. And yet the commission was able, I think as the experience went on as she testified, that commission played a role. So I just wanted to be clear that our witness today was always for reparations for Japanese Americans. It was the commission that she had a problem with and she came to believe that the commission ended up being a good idea. I also just wanna quickly, if I could, uh, cause I see it popping up in the chat as well, address this issue of, I use the term black nativism and so I think we need to have an honest conversation about that as well. Nativism is a kind of national chauvinism and that kind of anti-integrationism that we see, you know, the MAGA people doing. I mean, that's Trump stuff, right? Uh, you know, make America great again and, you know, uh, scapegoating uh, immigrants and so forth, um, which is in principle wrong. We are not to do that to any human beings. Within the African-American community, if we were to be truthful, there are some people who really are kind of resentful. I mean, there are just too many Nigerians up in here. I mean, what, what, what are them Caribbeans coming over here taking our jobs? So there's now this notion of having a distinct African, uh, 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 American African identity to distinguish us from them. I've even heard this in conversation because they are taking our jobs. We need to have, when we talk about programs, these jobs are for the African-American identity folk and them Nigerians and the Ghanaians and them Jamaicans, you know, they don't get them. Now, come on. We are not going, at least from my perspective, that's, that's I mean, if we have issues in our communities, I mean, we have something called a Pan-African Unity Dialogue in, in New York, where there are sometimes tensions and issues that we need to talk through, but we will solve them as African people among ourselves. We should not allow ourselves to be divided on the basis of we're going to say that our sisters and brothers, you know, our, as African people, that we're going to exclude them or somehow um, label them in such a way that they can't get certain benefits. So I think fundamentally, I would appeal to my sisters and brothers to think about that. We have a bigger tent than that. I'm not saying they're not issues that we don't need to discuss and resolve, but we can resolve them by talking to each other. And we certainly don't need to adopt some right wing and some there's some suspicion that some of this is coming and some people may unwittingly be buying into it from some right wing sources who have this kind of conservative position and therefore they can recruit black people on the basis of grievance and resentment against our own brothers and sisters. I hope we don't fall into that trap. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. Um, 
we have about five minutes left. So I'm gonna go to a, a question that was emailed to me earlier today. Um, are we to believe that uh, the majority Democratic US House of Representatives are in favor of this bill? And what are the prospects uh, for this reparations bill being passed in the Senate? Anyone can start, um, Nikichi. Okay. Uh, sure, I'll start. Okay, so we have more co-sponsors than we've ever had in history. We have a Senate bill introduction, which we have never had before uh, in history. We are doing everything that we can to get as many co-sponsors and bring it further across to the uh, finish line, but we know how to count also, okay? And we know how to count and we're pretty much certain that the bill will pass the House of Representatives. We know how to count. We know that in the Senate, even though we have a very, very slim majority that it it takes more than that to withstand a, a filibuster. Again, we know how to count. So what does that mean? That means that we're not putting all of our eggs in one basket. If and when that time uh, comes, we're going to be making uh, a concerted effort to look at some of the other uh, baskets, such as the executive order branch uh, basket, but not do it in, in, in a manner that it's just unwieldy, but to take the exact same commission bill, HR 40, S 40, and subsume it within uh, an executive order so that the, it can get passed and the commission can get to its work. Um, Ms. Kenneth Henry. Um, well, Nkichi has said it all, except I'm looking, we have 315 participants who are um, on this um, live stream. And if all 315 participants, 316 participants actually reached out to 10 or 20 of their best friends and asked them to call those congressional folk who have not come on board as co-sponsors on both the House side and the Senate side, do you know just how far along we would be as far as getting this bill across the finish line. So it, it, it's a good question, but the question has to be flipped. And we turn it around and to you, we say, <clears throat> to all 316 people on this call, um, a, a totally awesome thing that you can do is uh, reach out to those uh, Congress folk who have not come on board as co-sponsors, get your best 10, 15, 20 friends to help you out and make the calls. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. You know, there's just, <clears throat> I think what Nkichi and Kenneth have said is just really important. And the one thing that I'd like to say to, to have, at least have folks think about in terms of perspective, people, and Dr. Daniels addressed this some, people are thinking about, well, how long do you have to, did you have to be here? How long did your ancestors have to be here before you would be quote unquote eligible for some kind of reparations? And I think one of the things underlying that question is a view that somehow the things for which reparations are necessary stopped at some point. They're going on right now. So if you came here 15 years ago, your ability to get a house as a Black person, your ability to get an education, your ability to get a job, your ability to get health care has been impacted by what America has become since 1865. Let's remember that for 95 years after the Civil War, it was illegal for Black kids to walk into the same classroom as white children and sit down and learn something in school. So I think it's important to understand that the issues we are talking about in terms of reparations are still happening today. And, and at least take that into account as, as people are thinking about how should this be addressed? Any other comments? 
Dr. Daniels? Yeah, I just, I know we have to try and move into the next uh, powerful segment. I just think it's important to give a shout out to the visionary, courageous leadership of uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Uh, she has been absolutely incredible. I mean, she's taken this on as a legacy issue. Uh, I was so honored and so proud to hear people, more than one person evoke the name of Congressman John Conyers today, including uh, the Congressman Cohen from, uh, from Memphis, who said he was my mentor. And so people take a certain pride in, in taking this torch. But Sheila, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has been absolutely focused focused on this as a legacy uh, for not only Congressman John Condes, but for her legacy. And she has been relentless. And so I think we owe her a, uh, a, a, a big kudos and, and debt of gratitude. And it's not over. It's not over. We're going to have to stand with her, surround her, because this battle has really just begun. Getting the commission doesn't mean it's over. We really then have to ramp up to make sure that it does not then become diluted, co-opted, and so forth. So we're going to need a movement stronger than ever before. And so I, and again, I, I really appreciate the collaboration that we have with the HR 40 Strategy Group and all the people working together. But a big kudos to Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Thank you so much to all of you. We're going to have to move on to the second panel. Are there any final thoughts? I'll just say reparations is an issue whose time has come. Reparations now. That's right. Well, thank you so much to all of our panelists and panel one, attorney Nikichi Taifa, Dr. Ron Daniels, Jeffrey Robinson, and Ms. Kenneth Henry. Now we are going to our second panel, which will be hosted by Reverend Mark Thompson. Um, Reverend Thompson is the host of Make It Plain, a member of NCOBRA, the National African American Reparations Commission, and the Black Church Pack. Thank you so much and look forward to this panel. Thank you, uh, Sister Jam. We appreciate you. And let me commend all of the panelists who just spoke. Uh, this That was truly a, um, a, a reparations uh, dream team. Uh, and so we're going to uh, uh, continue uh, in, um, uh, in that vein uh, and bring forward now um, some of our other uh, panelists uh, in this uh, and who some of whom, at least two of whom were a part of the actual um, hearing that took place today. So let me do um, some introductions. I'm going to introduce all four of the panelists and then we'll hear from, from each one. First of all, he is the uh, male co-chair, the male national co-chair of NCOBRA. Uh, our dear brother, uh, Cam Howard, who testified today. Welcome to Cam Howard. Uh, we're glad NCOBRA is in the house. Um, and um, then we also have with us uh, from Howard University, um, our brother who has brought a great intellectual discourse to this discussion, Dr. Greg Kamathi Carr. We welcome him from Howard University. Thank you, Dr. Carr. Um, then we also have with us, uh, representing uh, Evanston, Illinois and the City Council Subcommittee. And this has become the model for what cities and states are doing with regards to reparations. Alderman Robin Sue Simmons, uh, is here with us. Robin Rue Simmons, I'm sorry. Uh, Alderman, good to see you again as well. And last but not least, the, the newest star in this reparations movement. She spoke uh, on today uh, at the hearing and we're so proud of her. She's brought an international flavor to this representing Human Rights Watch. And as I say, she's a newest star in the reparations galaxy. We started calling her today the Beyonce of reparations. So we're happy to have with us our sister, Dreesen Heath from Human Rights Watch. Uh, good evening and, and welcome to um, you all. Uh, Dreesen, let's begin with you. Uh, ladies first, um, how did you feel about the, the hearing today? And do you feel that it was effective and that it is going to make a difference in, in winning um, once this bill is brought to the floor? 
Thank you, Reverend Mark, and I appreciate uh, the wonderful introduction, um, but also to be in company again um, with such incredible folks um, and looking forward to this conversation. I think having the hearing um, so early on in the 117th Congress is extremely important and marks um, not only, um, you know, commitments hopefully by uh, Congress and by the committee to move this bill forward, but also marks the incredibly hard work <laughs> that people have been putting in for decades. And then most recently, um, in terms of garnering the most co-sponsors that we've ever uh, experienced under HR 40, that momentum clearly sh is showing through and um, Congress can't hide from that anymore. So, you know, I'm really hoping that this hearing, um, you know, it 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 was um, successful in um, putting the issue back out in front of the public. Um, obviously, we've heard we heard powerful testimony. We heard a breath and depth depth of information of uh, the harms, the range of harms, and why reparation is necessary. Why reparation is not a, a replacement for public policy why uh, reparation must uh, be administered in all necessary forms. Um, but we also heard some arguments um, that have been, you know, tired and holistically wrong um, and uh, needing to uh, move past these arguments that are um, wrongfully um, misunderstanding what the right to reparation and remedy is as defined in international human rights law and why um, we are still suffering from generations of trauma and injury um, that in the form of uh, current um, racial discrimination, but also enduring systemic racism. So um, I think it's an, an opportunity to build off, of top, off top of um, what scholarship and arguments were presented uh, to have uh, the Honorable Shirley, um, Shirley Weber to be a part of that panel was important as well. California just went on and said, we're gonna set, set up our own state HR 40 commission. Um, the federal government should be ashamed that um, a state um, went ahead and advanced uh, a commission modeled off of HR 40 before HR 40 was established. So um, it's it's time, and uh, I think this hearing um, lets people know that we're 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 moving forward on this. Thank you, uh, Dreesen. Cam Howard, how do you feel about the hearing, and and do you feel that it it is it will make a difference uh, in this fight? Do you feel that? the members of Congress uh, heard you, just how impactful do you think it was? And also please explain uh, why uh, Herschel Walker is such an Uncle Tom. Please go right ahead. <laughs> well, let me start there. You know, I think uh, the 30 or so percent of black folks who were not in favor of reparations, I think Herschel Walker and, and uh, Elder did such a bad job or great job, if you want to put it, that they switched over to our side. So we want to thank those two poems <laughs> as, as you stated. So, um, but the the, the uh, hearing was a success. What we wanted to do, uh, Reverend Mark, was to come out in this Congress, early in this Congress, pushing forth to the leadership, to the 535 Congress persons in the House and the Senate collectively, letting them know this issue must be dealt with early on in this congressional session. And to get a hearing of this magnitude in the month of February, in the first year of the Congress, is very important, it's huge. We laid it out that the legislation is, we are not accepting anything less than full reparations. I think that was repeated over and over in the, in the conversation. Uh, we got a tremendous amount of uh, solidarity from the Japanese Americans. I mean, it was just, a, it was an awesome, successful event. Because what we've always known was that this hearing was not the end all be all. This hearing was to position us to move this legislation through the legislative process. And so we're at the next step. You have to take these through stages, through steps in order to get to the House floor for a vote, in order to get to the Senate floor for a vote. And this was a necessary step. Uh, we got the type of uh, testimony from Dreesen and everyone who's on the panel 
uh, on, the, on the Democratic side to put it out there in no uncertain terms that this community must be repaired. And so that's all we really wanted to do is make it clear to Congress that there was a tremendous amount of uh, support uh, both within our community and in the allied community for this legislation. You had the leadership of the, of the, of the Judiciary Committee, uh, Chairman Nadler in favor, the uh, Chairman Cohen, the Chairman of the Subcommittee in favor. They have already talked with the leaders of the Democratic Party, Pelosi and Hoyer. They are in favor. So we have, we have strategically moved this legislation to a point for us to go to the next step, which is a, a, a vote in the judiciary and then to the full house for a full vote. Great. Um, Alderman Robin Ruth Simmons, how does the national debate on the bill, the legislation HR 40 and what happened today, even with the hearing, support um, some of the local initiatives like the one you're involved in? Uh, and also I think we do well for those who don't have a full grasp of what you are doing in Evanston when it comes to reparations to explain um, what that local initiative is all about, if you would, please. You, you, we can't hear you, uh, Alder, Alderman. No, still can't hear you. Looks like you're unmuted too, all right. Maybe the uh, settings, maybe check your computer settings, the Zoom settings. Yeah, check, check your audio settings, that might be it. While we are waiting on Alderman Simmons. I want to give her another second to see if we get her, her audio up. I heard something. Now? Yeah, we go. <laughs> there we go. Okay. We now, all right. I had a uh, Cam Howard moment, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, the question was, uh, what are we doing in Evanston and how does the national discussion uh, play into what we're doing? What we've done in Evanston is like uh, Dr. Weber said, we decided to advance reparative justice in the form of reparations for blacks in Evanston and not wait on uh, HR 40. We did it appropriate and in line with the injury that is documented and able to be defended in our city. And that's largely found in the area of housing um, our zoning and other uh, wealth um, stripping actions and policy that are in our city. So we have advanced a policy that funds uh, reparations for Blacks in Evanston. It's an initial $10 million commitment. We are using the um, cannabis sales tax 100%, the first $10 million, 100% um, of that tax is going to fund our work. In addition, the fund is open and receiving contributions from residents in town, families, and even businesses now have joined in our reparation uh, commitment in Evanston. So we have strong ally support. Uh, we was really happy to see the testimony uh, from the Japanese community today, speaking with them this weekend and really proud of the solidarity that we share there. Um, the faith community has made a commitment to reparations in contributing in, um, in dollars and also in uh, learning and educating their congregations and learning more on how um, they can support the goals. So we have advanced reparations. We have our first remedy policy has passed our committee, which is a $25,000 direct benefit up to $50,000 per household direct benefit for residents for housing. Um, and we understand that there are interests in other policies. And uh, we do understand this is a process. This is legacy work. This is, I have a lifetime of work ahead of me. I'm clear of that. My children have a lifetime of work ahead of them. Uh, but we have started and we have committed the first um, 400,000. Understanding that 
more remedy policies need to come, more understanding. Uh, we have had a very thorough uh, report that's now about 100 pages done by Shorefront Legacy and Dino Robinson, who is a founder there, that gives our case for local reparations. And we are proud of the work. You can learn more about it at the City of Evanston uh, website, cityofevanston.org. But it's important that the national conversation is advancing because it helps me um, help our community look to, we alone as a municipality are not responsible for the injury. Local efforts are not going to address full repair in this nation. It is gonna take a, collect, a collective, a collaborative effort from every level of government, including the states. And obviously HR 40 is the uh, keystone to repair in the black community in this nation. So for us in Evanston, it is nice to see that the conversation is advancing. I believe that it was effective because as Brother Cam said, it happened very early um, in this Congress and it starts the legislative process. It is necessary to get to whatever that next marker is so that it can advance through a legislative process. I believe that it was effective. I believe especially since we have a President Biden who campaigned and on his, um, his rapport and commitment to the black community. And we have a vice president who was original co-sponsor for the first Senate companion bill that now are leaders in this nation. So it gave notice to Congress and it allowed us to, um, to start to advance the process. All right, thank you very much, Alderman. Uh, Dr. Greg Carr, good to see you again as always, my brother. How do you feel about the hearing and the message it got over to um, our, our people? Um, do you think that today's hearing helped further to inform our people about uh, the importance of HR 40? And do you think it also is helpful um, in, in, in continuing a rational conversation? We know that there's a, we even seen it in some of the chat, I mean, here tonight, um, and it was talked about in the last panel, there's a, there are a lot of other things going on when it comes to this debate uh, to really divide and distract our people, some, some other players in this. Um, um, how do you feel about this hearing today and what impact it will have on unifying our people? Well, first of all, thank you, uh, dear brother Matsumila. Um, like me, you know, our generation came into this work, uh, I guess it's been now a little over three decades ago in, in, in with the Nkiji Taifas and the Cam Howards and the Mashariki and Jambal Kawanzas and so many Conrad Wells and others. And we kind of got deputized. So it's something to sit here with this gray hair and say, <laughs> we're now looking at this revival movement, it's extension It's very important. I want to thank as well, Cam and Andreessen, especially uh, for the work you did on the Hill today, virtually. Um, I think it was an important conversation, of course, and maybe the most important conversation that this country has ever had. Um, Cam, something you said earlier in during the, uh, the testimony today, talking about federal, state, local government, and uh, Alderman Simmons, you definitely have showed that model, and we saw our, our former colleague in Black Studies, uh, Shirley Weber, who's setting the world on fire out there in California, uh, no pun intended, definitely no pun intended, especially with this weather event going on right now. I hope everybody is trying to stay safe and warm in Texas, Louisiana, and other places. But, you know, you have local and state government doing this. But, Cam, when you said federal, state, local government, and then you name corporations and other institutions like universities, we're talking about a structure in world history that's very recent. All those institutions come out of the West, the concept of the nation state, so forth. Um Every country on this side of the ball is a settler state, including this one. And, and this one's going to disintegrate fairly soon. I think HR 40 is really a piece of legislation that's about, is really, really will study the possibility of America. HR 40 is also a barometer on how close we are to an event horizon. The reason you can get it going in an Evansville, I think, the reason you can get it going in a California is because demographics have shifted. And as the demographics shift, the possibilities begin to present themselves. But the possibilities really aren't about national unity or uh, achieving some sense of a nation, because this isn't a nation. It is a state with a number of different nations in it. Think about John Henry Clark saying that many times, our, our elder, our Jegna. And what we saw today was the beginning, as Ron Daniels said, 
another long distance runner of the big be the beginning of the debate what will be very interesting once this commission is passed and of course we know it's going to pass the house i agree with in kichi um joe manchin gonna act a fool Kristen Sinema gonna act a fool out of Arizona. So you got to push them or drag them over the finish line. And then somehow, as Abraham Lincoln, as Jerome Bennett Jr. said, his hand was shaking when he signed the Emancipation uh, Proclamation. Well, perhaps Joe Biden's hand will be shaking when he signs. He doesn't seem to want to forgive any student debt, which is entirely in his power to do with the struggle with pain. Talk about that a little bit later, perhaps in the context of reparations. But once this gets over, the next stage will be the debate and the conversation in the commission itself. Imagine those hearings all over this country. I think that's when a lot of stuff gets settled. And having read Sandy Darity's book a couple of times, some very interesting and important work in there, but this is not the time now for folks to parachute in out of left field and try to rewrite policy at the level of insertion that the black bourgeois have often done. This is the commission where we finally have the conversation about the possibility of America. When we look at those five injury areas, the first of them is peoplehood nationhood. And I think that's where the problem starts. When you start talking about self-determination, Dr. Daniels again was right. We're talking about Pan-Africanism, nationalism, propelling this. You're talking about making a moral demand in a system of nation states that has this does not have morality at its center. This is Marimba Ani, it's a rhetorical ethic. They don't owe us anything. You, you only owe, oh, Ethan Randolph talks about that. You get what you can take and keep. There is no moral argument for reparations in the modern nation state system. It's about who has the power whether it be the, and in this country, if the Democrats or the Republicans, both of these parties are hostage to finance capital. One of those institution networks that the Cam is talking about. But in order for them to maintain the ability to make policy in service of finance capital, they have to attract voters. The GOP has doubled, quadrupled down. They are now the party of white nationalism. They are the white nationalist party. The Democrats can't win without that demographic. And as that demographic shifts, the policy concessions they will make in order to sustain themselves in power could very well include an opening up of the economy. This is what HR 40 is, is is beginning to insert itself into. But that first injury area, and we'll talk more about this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop after I say this. This first injury area, speaking to the trauma, I mean, we, we haven't gonna get to the second one, education, the third one, health, the fourth one, criminal punishment, the fourth one, wealth and poverty, the first one, peoplehood, nationhood, that places a knife's edge on the question of what does it mean to be an American? And so when I see Herschel Walker, when I hear uh, the, the brother out of Utah, whose daddy was on the faculty of Florida A&M for 40 years, when I see, you know, Larry Elder, who with the death of Rush Limbaugh, maybe they'll give him 15 more dollars so he can keep talking with that slant mouth and that slack jaw look in his eye. I'm looking at victims of trauma. <laughs> you understand? They are victims of trauma. Herschel Walker said, how you gonna pay some? My mom said, how can you pay somebody for somebody who was lynched or your uncle who was hung? Right, he's making the same argument. But the problem with trauma is that is a question of self-repair. And part of that self-repair requires a demand of self that can't be made of another person, particularly when whiteness is the thing that unifies the concept of the American nation state. They don't owe me how I view myself. So I think this HR 40 legislation is really about the possibility of America and whether or not we're at, events or at an event horizon to renegotiate the terms of this nation state or whether it's gonna dissolve and we'll do it from the state and local level. Powerful points. Yeah, the, the, the testimony of the, of, the, of the Uncle Tom's is pretty much um, emblematic of why we need reparations, the severe uh, long-term transgenerational post-traumatic slave syndrome exposure. That that is that speaks to it. A, a lot to cover. I'm going to come back to you, Dr. Carr, um, on a few things. Uh, but I want to go back to uh, um, uh, reparations, Beyonce, for a moment or two. Dreesen, um, what is next? We've had this hearing. So what is now the immediate follow-up? What are the action things that people need to be about right now? Yeah, thank you for that question, um, because we're, we're in forward progress and we need to stay in forward progress. Um, and that means getting uh, the, the last, uh, you know, Democratic for uh, Judiciary Committee members co-sponsoring the bill. Um, ideally, we would have uh, <clears throat> as many co-sponsors as possible within the Judiciary Committee. We know that we have enough votes to pass it. Um, but you want to shore that up. So you have, you know, Representative Deborah Ross in North Carolina today who spoke to 
the um, you know North Carolina compensating victims of forced sterilization, forcing disabled and black people into a eugenics program. She should be on that bill. Um, Representative Lucy McBath, um, the anniversary of her son's uh, death, uh, shooting, killing, and uh, just for having loud music in a parking lot uh, was just the other day. That pain, um, you know, pain of um, unarmed black, young black men being killed um, is a part of the, the remedy of, H of HR 40 and what proposals would speak to. Um, she needs to be on the bill. Representative uh, Greg Stanton in Arizona, he has expressed that he would vote yes um, on the bill. He also, you know, co-sponsors a uh, more symbolic measure um, that is not going to give us any repairs, such as uh, exchanging our current national anthem with the Black national anthem. He needs to be on the bill. Um, and Rep Representative Louis Correa in uh, California, he needs to be on the bill. So these are four <laughs> key names that you all today can start um, calling people, you know, put that on your to-do list tomorrow and through the week. You can call the Capitol switchboard 202-224-3121 um, and get connected to these um, offices to get them on the bill. Um, we also have to continue to, to, to educate. This is a public education campaign in addition to, um, you know, re reversing all of the harmful um, and damaging language such as some of the comments made today, um, you know, belittling the trauma and the um, uh, impacts of, of systemic racism on the Black community today. Um, these issues are real. Um, people are dying because of it. Um, we saw that Harvard Medical uh, Research Study re reference today. If reparations for slavery were administered, that curbs deaths and infections for Black community, but more broadly, we are over 500,000 deaths in the United States of, of COVID-19. Um, you know, the most developed um, democratic nation where people are just dying left and right. There's no, um, there's no excuse for um, remedy not to be administered so that the next time, the next generation, the next century that we may have a pandemic like that, that the same disease doesn't disproportionately impact um, Black people um, as it is today. Um, so in addition to responding to some of the, um, you know, the comments made in the hearing today, um, people need to actively push back and be on the offensive of what reparation means. Um, you heard today from many of our uh, witnesses that there are many forms of reparation. The next time somebody tells you, you know, it's just about compensation, you, you have the um, ability and authority now to say it actually includes compensation, rehabilitation, guarantees and non repetition, making sure we're transforming institutions that have never functioned to serve or protect Black people like the criminal legal system and the policing system. Um, also, you know, needing a um, apology on the books. The, the House and the Senate did pass um, a, apology resolutions and they were insufficient, but they were also not signed into law. So in terms of the federal government actually <laughs> being able to to say we apologize for the wrongdoing of uh, the institution and Jim Crow segregation, that has not happened yet. Um, we need to be able to um, put markers and know where um, communities have been in red line, where hundreds of thousands of Black families have been displaced. Um, all of these measures uh, encompass what, what is needed, healthcare specific reparations, education uh, specific uh, reparations, um, not, not um, equity policy, but, but reparations that get to specific harms um, that have been inflicted on the Black community today. Um, so I would say education and also mobilizing to get these members on the uh, Judiciary Committee ready to vote because we will be demanding a vote um, very soon. And there's no, ex <laughs> there's no excuse after this hearing uh, for that vote not to be set up. All right, thank you, Dries and Heath. Uh, Cam, talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm gonna throw this to you. 
talk about what, well, how this commission is going to deal with reparations proposals. Um, um, some people seem to think that now is the time to debate proposals. Uh, and I've got this one proposal, this has to be the one. Explain why that's premature and why it really was in the spirit of Ujim Ujima and Ujima that we would argue for a commission so there could be collective thought and discussion, even public hearings. Because that's what this commission will be empowered to do, right, Cam? They'll be able to even hold public hearings on reparations proposals and also address why um, uh, individual versus uh, collective reparations is, is, a, is a both and as opposed to an either or. You're muted, Cam. Thanks, Brother Massimella. You know, that's very important. You know, the commission is designed, uh, as Dreesen said, with these particular outcomes in mind. These are the out, this is the level of proposals that the commission is supposed to generate. One of the things that NARC introduced was the NARC 10 point reparations platform that they went around the country, or we went around the country trying to get buy in from our first uh, 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 informing our people that this commission had been formed and that these were some of the possibilities that we could propose and to just get from our community a, a, a understanding and input on what they would like to see the commission work do. The commission is designed to create a mechanism by which proposals can come through and then those proposals will be then packaged in a document and delivered to Congress for funding. And so really the proposals, the development of the proposals is something that the community do collectively. It's not one individual, it's not one organization, it's a collective process where we get buy-in from across the country. As you stated, uh, Massimella, the community, is the commission is supposed to have uh, local forums, national forums around the country. And it would debate those particular proposals. And COBRA uh, stated, uh, initiated about two years ago, we didn't follow through because we focused more so on getting the bill passed on putting out a call to various organizations to determine what type of repair was necessary, put a plan together, if it was an education, if it was an economic development, and these would be some of the basic things, basis of which the commission's work will be formed. What we would like to see the commission do is immediately separate themselves into these five areas of injury, five areas of uh, reparations. There'll be a subcommittee on cessation and guarantees of non-repetition, a subcommittee on satisfaction, a subcommittee sub uh, on compensation, a subcommittee on, on satisfaction, and a subcommittee on restitution within the commission and each one of those subcommittees flush out a number of proposals to meet the outcomes of repair that we need, the holistic repair that we need. Now, in the context of this conversation around direct repair or collective repair, there's gonna be two forms of repair. Repair that is collective, no one has to qualify for. You just simply have to be of African descent and it's repair, for instance, any type of criminal justice reform is gonna affect all African people. That's a collective benefit. When it comes to a, a direct benefit in the form of an education grant, you may have to qualify. In the form of compensation, you may have to qualify. That's a direct benefit, but, but the majority of the initiatives needed to bring wholeness to our community are of the collective type. Therefore, there's no reason to have all of this conversation and debate about who gets what. It only, that, that conversation is only if there's compensation. And if there's compensation, and we, we have always been in favor of compensation, but we have not pushed compensation out there in the, in the mainstream because we know we, that's the area where we would get the most opposition. And so why would we push something that we know is going to get the most opposition and we know we need allied support to pass it? So we don't highlight that. We say that it is necessary. We say that we want it. We say that we will fight for it, but we do not put it out there as the top issue that we're fighting for because the top issue is repair and wholeness. And so uh, under, under direct benefits, only in the area of compensation, 
we say that there are three periods of harms. Because people want to say, you want to put Caribbeans in there, you want Caribbeans, you want Africans who just came here to get to get uh, reparations. Yeah, they should be repaired if they was injured by this country. Anyone who's injured by this country should be repaired by this country. So there's three areas of injury. The first period of injury was the period of enslavement from 1619, not 1776, from 1619 to 1865. If you are a descendant of someone whose ancestors were enslaved and there's compensation for enslavement, you would, be, you would qualify. Caribbeans who were enslaved in the Caribbean would not qualify for that particular reparations because they were not here in America, enslaved here in America for that particular reparation. And so they are not qualified, they are not eligible. However, there was a second period of injury and criminality amongst our people, or crimes against our merit, crimes against our humanity. And that was a period of Jim Crow segregation, 1865, roughly about to about 1965. If you were here during that particular time and you came from the Caribbean, you came from the continent, you came from anywhere and you're black and you were injured during that particular time and there's repetitive initiatives for Jim Crow area crimes, then you should be repaired. You are eligible for that repair, not for enslavement, but for the Jim Crow period. And then you have the third period of criminality against our people, and that's the post Jim Crow to the present mass incarceration, uh, predatory lending, redlining, uh, and, and, and other forms of, of discrimination. Police terror. If you were injured by this government, state, local, or federal, in any of those areas, then you have the right to be repaired. And you could have just came here last week and you were injured, you should be repaired in a collective form or even in a, in a direct benefit form if, it, if, you, if you meet the eligible criteria. And so, yes, Africans should be repaired. Yes, Caribbeans should be repaired. Yes, descendants of Africans enslaved in America should be repaired according to the period and the type of injury they have been subjected to. Thank, thank you, Cam, very uh, eloquently and articulately um, stated, you know, as, as I've said before, and it's been repeated in the last panel, um, they didn't ask Amadou Diallo if his ancestors were enslaved. That's right. you know, they killed him because he looks like us. Uh, and I think we have to be uh, very, very clear about that. Um, Alderman Simmons, how has the reparations initiative in Evanston uh, been received by the community? How has it affected the community? Um, is it something that we can also cite as an example, the reparations initiative there, as to how reparations and repair is empowering for the communities that uh, are beneficiaries of it? Absolutely. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Great. So we passed our policy actually in November of 2019, and that started really the road to repair that truth and reconciliation movement. It began a real conversation. We have said yes to um, our history and anti-Black racism, and we have made a legislative commitment and a budgetary commitment to advance that. So that forced the hand to have real conversations. Um, the ally community has awakened. They've shown up in solidarity. They've had a lot of, of questions. Um, the Black community has been emboldened to really speak out about um, the lived experience in Evanston, a city that is uh, very diverse and we celebrate our diversity. We're welcoming and inclusive. So just in passing the legislation, although we have a lot of work ahead of us, has really started to bring repair. Um, in addition to our housing uh, policy, initial policy, we're working on that full repair. We have passed a uh, historic marker, a African-American uh, heritage sites. We have several locations in town that have been, that will be marked and they are uh, landmarks now. Uh, we are working at um, improving our policy. So number one, um, cessation or guarantee of non-repetition, looking to address our housing policy and, and exclusive uh, housing or zoning policy, R1 zoning and brother law or three unrelated different housing policies that have intentionally um, impacted the black community understanding that there's a lot of work. It's been good for our community. 
as I said, we have allies that have been contributing and thinking about um, their role and how they have continued to keep a black community oppressed and how they might participate in repair as individuals and how their institutions and communities that they might represent can contribute in uh, reparation. So I believe that when we pass or advance it in, in, a, in, in this nation, that the same will happen. We can really advance the conversation past an apology. Uh, we can really advance it past truth and reconciliation. The best way to apologize is with change behavior. And I believe that reparations is really the only form of apology that we need to be accepting right now as a black community in this nation and in Evanston. Okay, now you can. And, and, and as a matter of fact, um, Dr. Carr, thank you, uh, Alderman. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Carr, reparations is really it. It is really the catch all for everything. Now, um, uh, uh, the Biden administration, and I may have a clip, I'm gonna try to, while you're talking, I'm gonna try to put it up for everyone here. The canned statement that the White House press secretary gave today is that Biden supports a reparation study. The question as to whether or not he was signed the bill was dodged, but what they all keep saying, and Cedric Richmond has even been saying this, that Joe Biden doesn't wanna wait for HR 40. He's gonna do his own reparational things in and around reparations and equity. How should we receive that, um, Dr. Carr? Is, is that acceptable? And when people start talking about equity and inclusion and diversity, is that really a substitute for reparations? Well, we've heard, brother, that it's not. Um, I think it's important. Yeah, you want to create the commission by executive order as long as it is it is every letter of every word of every sentence of H.R. 40, then go ahead. But in context, we have to understand that we're talking about power. We're really talking about politics and power. Ron Daniels laid it out. And when we start talking about reparations, we're really talking about what you can take, what you can hold, as I said, Philip Randolph says. You know, interestingly enough, today when we heard Professor Adeyumi evoke international law, that is the framework out of which this whole conversation comes. We know the United States doesn't have any respect for international law, except that it benefits them. And this is something that perhaps the folks who think about this question of descendants of slavery should put in context. Any advance that Africans have made in this settler state has come as a result of direct result of the settler colonies and then the settler state determining whether those concessions will be good or bad for them in the world system. There is no Brown versus Board of Education without the African independence movement and the fear that they would turn to the Russians or the Chinese. And they say, well, well, no, why would we turn to the United States? Look how you treat our cousins. And yes, there have always been tensions, but part of this, this idea of equity and diversity is really about this, this settler state trying to maintain itself as the demographic shift. And so if we need to leverage that, then what we have to do is curate more allies, not have less, because they're going to do that in order to try to retain themselves. The White Nationalist Party has already moved for everything from voter suppression to you know, all types of attempts to forestall that politically. And now the Democratic Party has to, is making a calculation on the, what, how little or how much it can concede to maintain its status. And so we have to look at this distinct from party politics and pursue exactly as Dreesen said, you got to pursue this thing now relentlessly to get this legislation across. If Joe Biden wants to forestall this by signing and it, and it makes the commission exactly as it is through the legislation, then fine. And maybe that might be a strategy worth pursuing, particularly when you look at the shaky senators, the couple of two or three in the Senate. Now, that having been said, let me let me let me end with this. And, and Cam, thank you for laying that out, brother. It's premature to talk about who would get what. The establishment of an ancestor who was enslaved is a, is a flawed conversation. The repair is structural, decentralized, and anchored in resource transfer and placemaking. So piecemeal attempts to address this, as we've just heard. Uh, we heard Alderman Simmons say that. It's not effective on the broad level. 
even as we fight at the local level and state level, ultimately the federal government has to intercede for the transfer of resources, which by the way, parenthetically, will be coming from our tax dollars. And it's not like we, you know, I'm like, wait a minute, I paid my tax, and now you don't want to give me my money back for this? I mean, actually, there's a little trick bag in there as well. And we could talk a little bit better. Cam, you raised it at the testimony day when you started talking about the possibility of private companies, and then Old Woman Simmons raised it as well. But let, let, me, let me end with this. The question of equity, the question of diversity is really a question of not displacing whiteness as the organizational logic for the nation. You start talking about peoplehood and nationhood. Now you're now you're attacking the fundamental concept of whiteness as the organizational logic of the country. When you start talking about education, hell, Herschel Walker practically begged for black curriculum. Did you hear him today? Even as he was tap dancing, he said, I'm tap dancing because I don't know my history. I mean, that's basically the translation. I wish I had the history. But you're talking about now reimagining the project. Parenthetically, I didn't hear much today about our First Nations kin, but if we understand the roots of this reparation struggle, certainly coming out of the Black Power Movement, as it took the baton from Queen Mother Moore and those and other, you got the American Indian Movement, you got the Young Lords, uh, right there, uh, all women Simmons, where you are, you come a little bit farther south, you're in North Chicago. That's where you had the Young Patriots, the so-called Hillbilly Harlem is what they call it. That's what they killed Fred Hampton for, unifying the Blacks, the Browns, and those poor whites. You're talking about un- you're talking about destabilizing the structure that keeps this country apart, which is why we have to be very careful. If Biden says he wants to do this, what we can't have happen is a handful of those black elites. And I'm, I'm very, I'm very, be careful, be, be very careful about this right now. Try to inject themselves at a level of policymaking without the momentum of mass organizing movement and do what has happened every time we've had a mass movement which is supported by international movements and then the concessions are made. That tiny black elite negotiates on behalf of the rest of us, benefits the most, and we look up and say, oh, we got a few representatives. Look at that, that's nice. And the rest of us continue to suffer. That's a real possibility if the administration decides to come in out of left field and take executive order, then you gotta worry about who's in the room. I think the policy making way that has been laid out is the best way to do it. Do it out of the elected representatives. And, and I would dare say, you know, the, the movie that's so popular right now, Judas and the Black Messiah, uh, we are reliving some of that. Now, first of all, you know, we watch these movies, we enjoy them, but folks, we're not just supposed to look at these movies just for the sake of looking at them, just to Netflix and chill. Um, there are people in the Black Panther Party still in prison, still in prison from the Republican New Africa and the Black Power Movement. And, and that's what that is depicting. And then the division that it sowed between the unity that was trying to come together. We ought to look right now because there are those who are trying to sow division between us um, within the, 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 the reparations uh, uh, movement. We're gonna come back to that in a minute. Uh, Dreeson Heath, coming back to you. I think we have the clip now from the press secretary, Jen Psaki. I'm gonna try to play it and uh, then get your reaction on the other side. Let's see if everybody can uh, uh, can hear this. The president during the campaign supported the um, study for reparations, the committee to study reparations. There was a House Judiciary Committee hearing today. Um, does the president support the legislation? He stopped short of saying that during the campaign. Will he sign that if it came to his desk? Well, he's supported a study of reparations, which I believe is what's being discussed and studying the continuing impacts of slavery, which is being discussed in this uh, hearing on H.R. 40, I believe it is. Uh, and he continues to demonstrate his commitment to take comprehensive action to address the systemic racism that persists today. Obviously, that is uh, having that study is a part of that. But he has signed an executive order on his first day, uh, which would begin to deliver on his commitment to having an uh, all cross government uh, approach to addressing uh, racial inequality and, and, and making sure equity is a part of his entire policy agenda. But he certainly would support a study of reparations. Uh, and we understand uh, understands that we don't need a study to take action right now in systemic racism. So he wants to uh, take actions within his own government in the meantime. Uh, Dreesen, uh, your response uh, to that statement from the White House. Thank you. I hadn't heard that yet. Um, yeah, equity does not equal justice. Again, equity does not equal justice. And um, unfortunately, you know, some of the framing around these measures to 
do this kind of all out uh, look into, you know, our federal agencies. Um, you know, I did not see a plan to um, interrogate the origins of the Federal Housing Administration, which was built on restrictive racial covenants into the writing, the underwriting manual um, that determined whether or not Black people were going to get loans or not. Um, you know, that would be um, uh, uprooting and addressing systemic racism, not necessarily um, establishing more representation within that department or more diverse representation of folks, um, adding more um, diverse and color to an institutionalized problem does not solve the institutionalized problem, right? Systemic um, problems deserve systemic solutions. Um, and unfortunately, you know, a, a lot of this is wordsmithing and um, promises and we, we've always been the bargaining chip um, since enslavement and today. So this whole idea that, um, you know, the, the black electorate is gonna rise up and, um, you know, combat uh, forms of violence and, and show up into an election um, and, you know, vote towards human rights. Um, and then in turn, um, we're gonna hear words like, we're gonna end systemic racism, we're gonna end white supremacy. Um, that all means nothing because if you're not talking about repair, we're, we're never getting <laughs> to, to that ending. Um, we can never solve um, the vicious, viciousness of white supremacist violence if we have not properly documented or accounted for the racial terror that has wreaked this country for centuries. Um, there's still people today, the only race massacre to be um, actually compensated for was the Rosewood race massacre in Florida, two years, 1923, two years after um, the 1921 race massacre. Um, the only massacre, there were hundreds of massacres, there were thousands of lynchings, there were other um, forms of incidents of racial violence that have never been accounted for, and people don't even know they exist. Um, they're not in our education um, resources, but they're also not talked about in public discourse because part of the trauma of, of being able to um, process what has actually happened is that, um, you know, communities that have been affected can't even talk about the harm. And so then you get this revisionist history by the government um, that says, yeah, we help, we help those people. In the case of Tulsa, they block the rebuilding efforts. They say, we're gonna promise you full restitution and reparation right after the massacre happens. And instead they side with real estate developers to try to mow down Greenwood um, and make it a, an industrial site, trying to um, build a, a railroad road, road port. That didn't, that wasn't successful then, but today you see gentrification driving out um, black Tulsans into North parts of Tulsa that are relegated to poverty, relegated to disinvestment in resources and education, healthcare, um, access to employment, um, uh, you know, deprivation of small businesses and, and economic development. That was the heart of, a, of the Greenwood neighborhood. So, you know, I implore this administration to really interrogate um, and, and perhaps get some better advisement uh, within their cabinet um, to actually address um, these issues holistically. We're not talking about policy determining our future outcomes. We're talking about the remedy, the reparation that's necessary for the past and ongoing harms because reparation is about contemporary harms too. It's not just about you know, the institution itself, uh, post-emancipation racist policies. It's also about the policies that just um, you know, 50 years ago were instituted and are impacting um, Black people's access to capital and other uh, key resources. Idrisa, while I have you, since you're part of an international organization, Human Rights Watch, do we have indications that the international community would be with us in this fight, uh, even if it meant at some point, if this bill can get passed or Biden won't sign it or whatever, that the international community might be open to, to being organized on our behalf 
and in our defense in the way the international community was organized against apartheid South Africa. Is that, you think that could be an option? I think that's absolutely a possibility. And you've seen bodies take positions that they haven't historically taken in, in the wake of um, the summer and fall protests uh, against um, police violence and racial injustice. You've also seen um, the UN Working Group of, of People of African Descent in 2016 put out a comprehensive um, recommendations, which included the passage of HR 40. You have, um, you know, our special rapporteur, uh, uh, Professor Achuame, who spoke today so eloquently in the panel. Um, her 2019 report outlines um, what is necessary for um, rectifying the, the vestiges and, and the structures of colonialism and uh, enslavement themselves, but also the ongoing entrenched racial discrimination. Um, you've also seen other bodies engage on this issue. Human Rights Watch has has um, gone to, um, you know, through the universal periodic review with the United Nations, we have brought the issue of reparations in addition to other national organizations who, who um, mark that as something that countries need to flag for the United States to rectify. So I think we're moving towards that. We need some more groundswell um, support. Um, but I think it's an opportunity and some bodies have taken steps to properly acknowledge what needs to be done. I'm, I'm, I'm putting that in the atmosphere, y'all, because that's, as an anti-apartheid veteran, that was some of the best organizing we ever did, Dr. Carr and Cam and others. And we, we felt the fruits of that labor. So I think, you know, America needs to be on notice. We might have to do what we have to do. Um, Cam, your reaction to the Biden White House statement, I like what Dreesen said about wordsmithing. And, and we've noticed they're consistent in there, which shows everybody they've all met on this because everybody says the same thing. So it's not, they can't ignore it. So they think, well, how are we going to deal with this? And to me, Cam, it's kind of, I don't know what it is. It's kind of arrogant to say we ain't going to wait on no study. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the study is supposed to be about us being self-determining, having a self-determining dialogue with ourselves about what our reparations ought to be. It's not supposed, supposed to be about the white president saying, I ain't going to wait on that. I'm just going to do what I want to do when it comes to equity and not even reparations. What's your reaction to that, Cam? You're muted, brother. There you go. So you're absolutely right. You know, the, the commission is about our community determining what our repair. That's what reparations is. The guilty party does not to tell the injured how they're going to be repaired. Hello. So, you know, this and Joe Biden has this, you know, <laughs> this white supremacist attitude. If he's going to take that attitude, it's not no different than any other you know, white nationalist attitude and, and um, position. Uh, I think someone mentioned earlier about this, the difference between this equity piece, this equity council. We, we, are, we applaud the equity council because the equity council fits into the area of cessation and guarantees of non-repetition. So the equity council would guarantee non-repetition. However, it does nothing or the accumulated harm and injury that took place before the equity council was put in place. It's like you're in, you have a, a football game and for three quarters, one team is cheating and collusion with the, with the referee. And then five minutes in the last quarter, they said, we're not, we're gonna play fair. We're not gonna call bogus calls. You get the same amount of time to, to call your calls. You get 11 men. I know you've been playing with nine men before, but you get 11 men now to play on offense and defense. And then you say, okay, let's start from there. But they already got a 77 point lead and you're at zero. And so we're gonna play fair from this point on, but you know, the season is almost over and, I, and there's no way I can get to a championship. There's no way I can even play in the championship. I can't even make the play. I can't even get a wild card because of the advancement in this particular uh, area of cheating. Uh, uh, the, 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 um, the lead is it's giving you. So I'm locked out. And so that's what this equity commission does. It's cool for 
a part of reparations, seeing that it's, it is to guarantees that guarantee that these instances does not continue in the past. However, there has to be the repair of initiatives also. So the Biden administration, first of all, you know, she doesn't even know what the bill number is, which is kind of crazy. You know, if this has been something that's been pushed out for, you know, in his, his, his entire campaign. So everyone in the campaign, everyone in this office should know that this is a bill and the, the bill number, what is this desire to do? So that's kind of telling in of itself. Uh, they're going to have to, do, the, the Biden administration is going to have to deal with H.R. 40. Uh, we are pushing this through Congress, but as has been stated earlier, we know that the challenges we're going to meet at the Senate side, and we're going to have to pivot at some point directly to Biden, and, and they're going to have to meet this front and center. And as Dr. Carr said, it has to be in direct, uh, a, a direct uh, similarity as the H.R. 40 congressional bill. But, you know, the Biden administration is going to have to deal with this, point and center, point blank. There's no getting around this issue. When, wouldn't be no Biden administration if it weren't for black folk. And we tried to say that, you know, we saved this country in putting the Democratic Party in. It was clear that if Trump had got back in, you would have had the shadow government no longer being the shadow government. The Klan was established to be a shadow government. And they were in the government in a shadow form throughout the Jim Crow period, they ran the governments in the South. And that was gonna be put back in play if Trump had won again. And so we, black folks, saved this country from that type of violence that would have been perpetuated and the, the clear, quick destruction of this country. In, at the conclusion of the Civil War, the, the Republican Party passed massive legislation on behalf of Black people. Dr. Carl Anderson said the se it was the second constitution that was for Black people, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, the 1867 Civil Rights Law, strong civil rights law, stronger than the 1965 Civil Rights Law. We have to say, we did for you, Biden, in the Democratic Party, the same thing our ancestor did for the Republican Party in this nation, in 1865, and we want the same type of reward. But that's on us. That's on us. And we had to make that fight. But we, we had to be clear and understanding what we've actually delivered to this segment of the white ruling class called the Democrats and what they owe us as a result of delivering the ability to rob the rest of the world. Because <laughs> that's really what it is. You know, they have an ability to get rich off of, of discrimination and terror and violence and colonialism, neo-colonialism, et cetera. And so that's really what we've handed them, but we have to get something in return. And we have to be clear that it's not just some equity council or anything of that nature. Um, it, 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 very, very well said, Brother Cam. Let me, there's a lot of, of stuff in the chat. Um, I want to shout out one person, a, a dear sister who's also been in the struggle, haven't talked in a long time. Sister, as you were talking about that, and we were talking about reacting to the Biden piece, uh, Sister Fia Nwangaza is in there in the chat. Peace to you, sister. She writes, Biden is disrespecting our right of self-determination, cornerstone of reparations, uh, international community already established, UN World Commerce Against Racism, Durban 400 work, recent UN reports, including African descendants, working group political prisoners, covering under treaty review. And this is, I think we're still in the decade of people of African descent. So all of this is very important. Um, those who are trolling the hell out of us constantly on HR 40, Alderman Simmons, you know, if you don't agree with HR 40 or you're not happy with it, even though there's no reason not to be, it's not like, see, even, even the Biden administration will be like, you know what? They could just try to pass a bill that says, give us $300 trillion. We didn't do that. We said, let's do a commission and see what forms reparations can take. They seem like they would just get on that and stop complaining. But if even for those of us who look like us or pretend to look like us, who have a problem with this, Alderman Simmons, in the meantime, they could be doing something in their own locale as what has happened in Evanston, as what has happened in California. So everybody, you know, upset about HR 40, those of you who are and don't quite understand it, in the meantime, you can get off your rusty dust and do something in your own locale. 
um, uh, Alderman Simmons, uh, give people advice on that. How would you encourage Thank someone you. watching uh, who you. want to go to their locale, their city or state and say, hey, let's do reparations right here where we are? Thank you. And that, that's how we got there in Evanston. Like the front line is where you are, right? And so mobilize in your own city. Work with your elected in your neighborhood, get a grassroots movement and come up with a coherent, viable, at least outline, and then share it with the uh, policymaker in your city and advance something local. The model has been um, introduced in Evanston and many other cities now, including Amherst. I see that there's someone from Amherst on the call as well. Um, please do, let's not uh, be paralyzed in perfecting the idea of HR 40. Let's be in solidarity on HR 40. And the work happens in the commission. We all agree that repair is justice, is due, is overdue. We are all operating in the urgency of now, but let's not delay uh, its passing by um, you know, infighting in our community. So uh, work on a grassroots level. And one thing that I, I have to say before this is over is without the support and the mentorship really of uh, the NARC commissioners, all of them in COBRA uh, reaching out and helping us um, understand the 10 point plan, what reparations is, how it's different than uh, ordinary public policy and understanding who should be weighing in on our reparations and even coming out to support our city physically with town hall meetings and other, um, other educational panels and symposiums. Um, just start the work, reach out to your elected, your elected can take it there. Once you say reparations is a commitment in your city, you will be surprised. We've had law firms and law departments at universities and independent you know, found family foundations and major institutions and international institutions that have reached out to help our city. And I believe that that would apply to other cities in this nation. So don't, don't get yourself so frustrated on this one. There's no one leader, there's no one policy, there's no one initiative. It's gonna take uh, years, generations, multi-levels of policy to get to justice for the black community and just start where you're at. And and Dr. Carr, as, as you'll get the, the last response to close us out uh, tonight, um, we're a few minutes over. Um, this is uh, our the month where we celebrate our history. And, and for those who are impatient, should they not heed the words of Frederick Douglass, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Everybody know what that word means? Eternal. There were sisters and brothers who fought against slavery, who were born in bondage and died in bondage, and they didn't give up. They didn't say this is taking too long. It's, they fought for the next generation to have a leg upon which to stand. So it's important, isn't it, as, as we segue from, from Alderman Simmons, you know, that, that this may take a little more time. This is a process. But if our ancestors could have endured enslavement for all those centuries fighting in each and every generation to bring it to an end to save america through the end of slavery and then once again slave, save america through this last election as it always does um shouldn't we take a page from those ancestors from our history dr carr and be resolved to fight through to the finish to make this happen absolutely um reparations and I think about all the times we gathered in Washington I think about Conrad and them those reparations marches we had in DC 20 30 years ago reparations presumes that a debt is owed a debt is only owed if you're talking about human beings who have a culture that believes in behaving as humans in the world that's not what we face we face a modern world system that is premised on the idea that there is a gold standard of humanity, that's whiteness, and everybody else is in descending order with blackness on the other end of the spectrum. Our ancestors here had ancestors. Some people say uh, we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. I'm like, boy, don't you ever reduce our ancestors' dreams to this settler criminal, this crime scene, particularly when the first crime of this thing is against the Aboriginals, Native Americans. So we heard earlier Kenneth evoke Cali House coming out of enslavement, saying, you owe us. 
that is that's based on two things. Number one, it's based on the self-determination, the declaration of our humanity, which we never lost. I'm not a descendant of a slave, like like uh, Nkichi said, I'm a descendant of an African who was enslaved, was captured, prisoner of war, marched into death camps called plantations. Like you said, it's always about language. You write about that, sis. You write, Dries. What? So the first thing it is, we're self-determining. The second thing is now it's on you because this is unsustainable, this little country you have. Our people came here from other places. I, I would add to Durban, uh, the meeting that Mashoud Abiola and them had in Nigeria, the reparations uh, piece. Understand the connection between international and domestic policy. If you wanna see reparations in this country, watch how fast you get it when the other countries in Africa, the Caribbean, Asia, other places say, we're gonna stop trading with y'all till you figure out what you're gonna do domestically about the least of these in this country. Watch how quick you get reparations here. L learn the history. So our ancestors had ancestors. Our people uh -huh. will survive one way or the other. And at the end of the day, this reparations demand is really a test of how much longer this little thing we call the United States of America will continue in its current form. I don't expect it's gonna continue much longer because what's really in the dock is America. Our people will survive America as Kwame Ture, our dear brother used to say. Yes, it's, 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 coming, uh, it's coming to an end. This has been an incredible panel. Let me just take a point of privilege to say one thing. Someone in the chat was saying how Malcolm X would have been a, one of these black nativists. Uh, to pick up on what Dr. Carr had said, uh, 56 years ago this month, February 4th to be precise, Malcolm X went to Selma, Alabama to stand with that movement, to stand with Mrs. King in the pulpit of Brown Chapel. It is not well documented, it was done in secret. When he left Brown Chapel after speaking to SNCC, and he said to SNCC, they, you all better give, he told the Alabama State P Police and Governor George Wallace, you better give Dr. King what he wants because we'll have to get it another way. But after saying that out loud, he was driven secretly to see Dr. King in jail in Birmingham. The jailers would not let him into the jail. They said, you can go outside and talk to him through the window. So Malcolm X spoke to Dr. King through an outside window in the Birmingham jail. This is in February of 1965. They agreed that when Dr. King got out of jail, they would come together and pick up where Marcus Garvey left off with the League of Nations and petition the world community for redress of our grievances. Malcolm had already been to Africa. He had been building coalitions around the world. That was a Pan-Africanist tact that Dr. King himself agreed with. It is my hypothesis, Professor Carr, that it was no coincidence that Malcolm was killed two, precisely two weeks later after that meeting in Selma and in Birmingham. So it is absolutely untrue that there was not the building of a world Pan-Africanist community picking up from Garvey, picking up from even Du Bois and others, uh, so that we could seek justice for ourselves. And if that had been carried to its logical conclusion, there's no question reparations would have been a part of that. This has been, folks, you have all been blessed by this reparations dream team for these two hours tonight. The first panel, incredible. Uh, we're thankful to all of them and all their hard work. This is the core of the reparations struggle. I want to shout out Sister Kenneth too. You know, the House has his own whip, James Clyburn, and we respect him, but the reparations movement has a whip too. And that's Kenneth Henry. And she's been whipping these votes and getting these sponsors on board. Let's thank our panelists tonight, the male co-chair, national co-chair of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America and COBRA. Join an organization. Kwame Ture said, every successful movement we had has been organization. Tweeting is not an organization. Facebooking, Instagramming is not an organization. Join an organization and support that organization. Join in Cobra. We're thankful to Alderman Robin Ruth Simmons who has made uh, has claimed her own place in history in the tradition of Cali House and Queen Mother Moore as a pioneering elect this is what a black elected official is supposed to do 
a black elected official who is is pushing forward something like this in, in, a, in a piece of creative legislation for our people. We are thankful for that. And of course, our, our intellectual scholar of the hour, Dr. Carr, who is continuing in the tradition of those who mentored him and me, Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Yosef Benyakin, and Dr. Sharshi McIntyre. And I know that they're looking down on my brother, very, very, very proud. Uh, and, you know, as he talked, the ancestry, our people, we gotta, we gotta remember we come from Africa. We don't come from America. And our history is circular, not linear. The European is linear, we are circular. So when you see Dr. Greg Carr, you are seeing Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben and Dr. Sharshi coming back around. We can't have an argument about reparations and then act like we aren't African. If we're gonna argue for reparations, we have to respect one another and, and operate under the principles of Ma'at and under the principles of the Nguza Saba when we treat each other as a way we respect each other. We're disrespectful to each other. We're not operating in an African fashion. And that's one of the reasons we need reparations for that healing to go back to the root of, of who we are. This, this is not the root of our existence. This is where we deserve to be compensated for building this country, taken from our homeland. Hedger Herschel Walker said we weren't, but we were. He needs to brush up on his history. And last but not least, uh, a very important young person in this movement, making all the difference in the world, bringing the international community with her. Again, Dr. King and Malcolm X wanted to raise the civil rights discussion to a human rights discussion. So Dreesen Heath is, is doing that. And she may not even realize it. That's how the ancestors move. We're going to get an organization like Human Rights Watch to pick up where Dr. King and Malcolm X left off. And can't be quoting Malcolm X and Dr. King if you don't understand. We even need reparations, as Cam said, for that period of oppression. We need reparations for COINTELPRO. And the longer they wait to give us our reparations, if another person is killed under police violence and the police demic, that just keeps the clock ticking. That drives the bill up every time that happens. So we're thankful to Dries and Heath as well as we affectionately call Reparations Beyonce, the new star of Reparations Movement. We are thankful to our panelists. We're thankful to all of you. Please get involved, join an organization. I wonder if Sister Jam wants to come back and have some closing uh, remarks from the NBC I Trust. We'll turn it back over to her. Jam, I apologize, I got a little loud at the end. No, we, no problem. We you, you said it all really at the end. Just thank you so much to all of the panelists. Thank you so much to Encobra for all of the work and pushing everything forward. Just thank you to everybody. And I just want people to look out for information coming from NBC I Trust and Encobra on upcoming events and the Encobra convention coming up this summer. So just be looking out. We will be getting in touch with you. Everyone that registered, we have your email. So we will be in touch. Anybody that has questions on how to get involved in the reparations movement, feel free to email info at nbcit.org and we'll forward your questions to NARC or in Cobra or whoever you need it to go to. But I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you and have a great evening.